Well, shalom, chevre. We're back at studying biblical Hebrew so that we're able to read it and to make sure that we understand everything that we read. Now, I'm sure that by now you've looked at Genesis chapter 1 and various passages, various verses, and seen the consonants and the vowels. And let's take a look at verse 1 once again together on the screen and see what we can recognize here. It's a familiar passage to us by now because we've looked at it so many times. But we read, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz, the heavens and the earth. As you look at this passage, you see that there are the consonants. And then you see that there are the vowels. You see the dagesh, which we've studied. You see the shva, which we've studied. But then you see that there's also a few other marks that we haven't studied. What are those marks? What are they doing here? And how do I work with them? What are they telling me? Well, these are the accents. And I just chose a few general, some of the primary ones that we'll take a look at. And I've highlighted them in yellow so that we can see them. These here are the accents that we're going to be looking at at the outset, outset of this lesson. You see this little reverse L, if you will? That's an accent. A little kind of a house-shaped uh, sign here, that's an accent. This under the olive at the end is an accent as well. So we'll begin by taking a look at, look at these accents so we understand how do we work with them and what do they tell us. Well, there are two primary accent types, categories, if you will. The first one is the ultima, and this is when the accent appears at the very end of the word. And then the second one is the penultima, when it appears one syllable before the end of the word. And when we see these accents, they actually have more functions than simply one. They have three fu functions to be specific. For us, when we read the text, the primary thing they do is they tell us where to accentuate the word. Do I say accent or do I say accent, right? Of course, I'm gonna say accent. Well, this is what the Hebrew accents tell us. Where do you put the tone on the word? Another element of the accents is for them to represent the chanting or the cantillations when the biblical text is being read or sung in a synagogue. So if you ever visit a synagogue, you will note that the, the singer, the chazan, actually follows a specific style of singing and that style is based on the accents that you see in the biblical text. And another element of these accents is that they tell us where to divide the sentence or the clause or the verse itself. They mark the syntax of the verse for us. So if you take um, a closer look at these accents, you will see that there is the disjunctive accents where they make a separation between words or clauses. And then there are conjunctive accents where they tell you, do not separate, make sure that you read this together. Let's take a look at the disjunctive accents first. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. That's Genesis 1.1. If you look at the very last word, ha'aretz, you will see that there is a symbol that comes after ha'aretz, and it's two diamonds. These two diamonds are called sof pasuk, which means the end of the verse. And what do they tell us? They tell us that it's the end of the verse. Now, this end of the verse or this symbol is almost always joined together with the accent that is called a siluk. And a siluk is a small vertical line that appears on the last word of the verse and it always appears on the part of the word where you accentuate the word. So we say ha'aretz and we say ha'aretz because we see that that's where the accent is and we know when we read the text that that's where you accentuate the word. Now we also see that there is a 
angle or a house kind of looking accent in this verse. Bereshit bara Elohim. So what is this accent? Well, this is the Atnach, the Atnach. And it tells us where there is a logical division of the verse in two. It's the logical division in the sense that it tells us where the two ideas pause. It's not the exact half of the verse when you count the words, that's not the idea. The idea is it's the logical division in the sense of where the first theme takes a small pause and then it continues with the next theme or the next idea. And let me bring up another accent here, which is called a zakef katon. And this is from a different verse. Kol kore, a voice of one crying, bamidbar panu derech Yahweh. In the wilderness, make clear the way of Yahweh. Well, you can see that the word kore, there are two dots above the resh. That looks familiar to us. It looks like a shva. It's not a shva. The shva appears below the word. In this case, these two dots appear above the resh, above the word. And so we know that they are an accent and they also tell us to make a pause here. It's a disjunctive accent called a zakef katon. There's also one conjunctive accent, accent that I'd like to mention here. And this is called the munach. And you can see it in our verse, Genesis 1.1, appearing under the word bara. It's this reversed looking L. Bereshit bara. And this is a conjunctive accent, which means that you don't separate, you don't pause, you don't divide the two words bara and then the next one Elohim. Bereshit bara Elohim. God created the heavens and the earth. So you make, you make sure that the word bara created is associated with the verb, uh, with the word Elohim. These are the accents that we're going to be seeing in all of the biblical text. And they're going to be telling us primarily where to accentuate the word, but also how to divide the verse into various clauses, into various parts, so that we know syntactically where there is a division. There is another part of Hebrew that I wanted to speak of today and that's the syllables. And the syllables are related to the accents. The accents help us understand various elements of the specific words and the syllables that we're going to be discussing. The first part of syllables that we want to talk about is how they appear in the text and what they are, what they do. There are two types of syllables. One is a closed syllable and one is an open syllable. The closed syllable is a syllable that consists of a consonant, then a vowel, and then a consonant. So it opens with a consonant and it closes with a consonant. Like for example the word but. But means daughter. It begins with a bet. It has a patach, the vowel. And then it has a consonant tav and that's where the syllable closes. There are also open syllables within the words and this consists of a consonant and then a vowel. So it remains open. Now let me just note here that sometimes we'll see the letter u, the shuruk, appearing at the beginning of a word. And in that case, we'll just consider the shuruk as a syllable in its own right. We'll see this when we start reading the text more. Now, let's just take a look and let's see which words and which syllables are open and which ones are closed. Remember that the closed syllables are consonant, vowel, consonant, and then the open syllables are consonant and vowel. So here's an example. The word ki. You have the kaf and then you have the hirik and the yod, the full letter vowel. Is this open or is this closed? It's open because it ends in a vowel. What about this word, susa? It ends in a kamatz 
hey, which is a full letter vowel. So this also is an open syllable. Now what about this word here, nirdam? The word ends with a kamatz and then a mem. Is this open or is this closed? Well, because it ends in a consonant, it's a closed syllable. What about this here? A het and then a sigol. Open or closed? This one is open because it ends in a vowel. How about this here? Said, samich, consonant, sigol, vowel, and then dalit, consonant. This is closed because it ends in a consonant. What about this one? A gimel, then a patach, and then a mem. This one is also closed because it ends in a consonant. What about this here? A noon and then a kamatz. This one is open because it ends in a vowel. So you can see that when you look at each syllable, you ask yourself, is this open or is this closed? And then you look at the consonants and the vowels and you see, is it consonant, vowel, consonant? In which case it's closed. Or is it consonant vowel, in which case it's open? But then you ask me the question, okay, but how do I know what is a syllable? How do I syllabify? How do I divide the word into various parts so that I know where the syllable begins and where the syllable ends? Well, let me give you the principles and then we'll take a look at a few examples. When you syllabify, you are simply dividing the vowels into different parts of the word. That's the fundamental principle. Divide between the complete vowels. For example, this word chesed, you have the chet and the segol, you have one vowel, and then you have the samech, the segol, and the dalit, and here you have a second vowel. So you split them up. And here you have the two syllables. Now this does become a little bit complicated when you have schwa's, for example. So when you have a silent schwa, you're going to divide after the silent schwa. Or if you have a vocal schwa, you're going to divide before the vocal schwa. And there's one more level of complication, but it's a good complication. If you have a strong degesh, what do you do then? Well, you split the degesh into two, as you can see here. You write out the two consonants that are doubled, and then you divide the vowels into two parts. And that division creates the syllables for us. But let's take a look at a few examples. So you have the word key. How do I syllabify this? Well, in this case, because I have one vowel, it's going to be one syllable. But what about the word susa? What do I do here? I take the vowels and I split them into two. I go after the first vowel, just as I do, I do here. I go after the shuruk, I draw a line and I get the two syllables su and then sa. What about in this word, haze? Well, here I split the vowels, I see the patach, and then I see the segol, I make sure that they're separated, and I have the two vowels before me. What about in this word chesed, which we've already seen? I split the vowels, che and then said, the two segols. What about if the word is slightly longer, like susato? Well, I do the same thing. I divide the vowels and I go after the vowel that I'm looking at. So in this case, I'm going to go after the shuruk. Then I'm going to draw a line after the kamatz. And I'm left with a tav and a polem vav. And that gives me three syllables, su, sa, and to. 
What if it's a really long word? Like let's say susotechem. Oof, that's a long word. I do the same thing. I split the vowels and I go after the vowel that I'm looking at. So in this case, it will be su, that's the first syllable, so, that's the second syllable, te, that's the uh, third syllable, and then chem, that is the final syllable. And this is a closed syllable ending with a consonant, the consonant mem. Now, what if I have a word that has a schwa in it? Well, in this case, I have to identify the schwa. Is it a vocal schwa or is it a silent schwa? Because that's going to tell me where I put the separation, before the schwa or after the schwa. And remember, if it's a silent schwa, you go after, and if it's a vocal schwa, you go before. Now, how do I know which one is it? Is it vocal or silent? I look at the vowel before it. If it's a short vowel, it's going to be silent. If it's a long vowel, it's going to be vocal. So now let's take a look at this word nirdam. I look at the schwa, I go to the vowel right before it. Is this a long vowel or a short vowel? It's a short vowel. So I know that this is going to be a silent schwa, which means I go after the schwa. Nir is the first syllable and then dam is the second syllable. Let's keep going and let's see if we can get a few more tricky ones if you will. Mishpat, where do I draw the separation? This also has a schwa. Well similarly I ask what kind of a schwa in this, is it in this case? I look at the vowel before it, I see that it's a short vowel and so I know it's a silent schwa, so I go after the schwa. Mish is the first syllable and then pat is the second syllable. What about a word like sofrim? I see a schwa here. Is it a vocal schwa or is it a silent schwa? I look to the vowel before and I see that this is a long vowel. Well, that means that I make the separation before the schwa. This is a vocal schwa, I go before it. And so the division is so, that's the first syllable. And then frim is the second syllable. And you can see that the pe with the schwa, the vocal schwa is attached to the rest of the word. Pe, resh, yod, and mem. Let's keep going. Let's take a look at this word, shmuel. It's a word we've seen before. Samuel is what it translates. And here I see that there is a schwa at the very beginning. Do I divide before or after? Well, what kind of a schwa is it? It's at the beginning of a word, which means that this is a vocal schwa, which means that I'm supposed to separate before, but there's nothing before it. So I don't draw any separation. However, I see that there are more vowels. And so I do need to create a separation between those two vowels, the shuruk and the tsare. And this is exactly what I will do here. So I will get shmu as the first syllable and then el as the second syllable. Now let's carry on. What if I have a word like ha'adama? And this also is a familiar word to us, ha'adama, adama, sounds like Adam, we've seen this before. Ground or the ground in this case, ha'adama. How do I divide it here? I see that there are a number of vowels. You have the kamats at the beginning, then you have a chataf patach under the aleph, you have a kamats under the dalit, and you have a kamats under the mem. What do I do? Well, first of all, I know that I need to separate this first kamatz from everything else. But I see a shva here, and so I ask myself, is it a vocal shva or is it a silent shva? Because that will determine if I go before or after. Well, remember that a compound shva, in this case a chataf patach, is always a vocal shva. So in this case, I'm going to go before the shva. And then afterwards, I will simply make the separation between the rest of the vowels and I will get this result. 
ha, a, da, and ma. I have three syllables here with three actual vowels, not half vowels, which is the chataf patach, it's a half vowel, but actual vowels. Ekamats here, ekamats here, and ekamats here. Now let's let, take a look at another level of complication. And this is a case where there is a dagesh that appears in a consonant. For example, diber. How do I divide diber? I see that there are two vowels. I know I need to split them, but I see that there is a strong dagesh in the letter bet. And I know I need to separate it because there's two bets. What do I do? Firstly, we make this separation that we are supposed to. We draw the line through the Degesh and we split the bet into two letters that it really represents. So I write out D, bet, bet, and then resh. And notice that I put a shva under the first bet. Whenever I split a word, I always put a shva under the first consonant that I'm splitting. Why? Because there's always a silent shva under the first consonant. Well, once I do this, I can carry on and make the separation between the vowels. You have a vowel here and you have a vowel here. And I just said that whenever you are separating a dagesh, a strong dagesh, you know that the shva is going to be a silent shva. And so you know you're going to go after the silent shva when you make the separation. And this is exactly what we get in the end when we make this separation. Div and then ber. Take a look at one more similar example. Kiset, which means chair or throne. What do I do here? I see that there is a dagesh in the samech, which is a strong dagesh. And I know that I need to split it before I do anything else. So I split the dagesh, I write out the two samechs, I make sure to put a silent shva under the first samech, and at this point, I simply separate the vowels. I know it's a silent shva, so I'm going to go after the silent shva, and then I have the final result, the two syllables, kis, and then se. Now, you have the principles, We've looked at a few examples and you can understand, you can understand how we make these separations within the words, how we syllabify so that we're able to read the words properly and to understand how these words are built together. But is there more, you're asking, is there more significance to syllabifying and understanding how the word is divided? The answer is yes. And let me just give you one more example. This is related to the kamatz chatuf. What is the kamatz chatuf? Well, remember the kamatz chatuf is that kamatz that looks the same, but one of them is short and one of them is long. The long one is the one that we pronounce as an ah, and the short one is the one we pronounce as an o. Oh. And we saw it in the chart of vowels, in the short vowels, you have the O, and in the long list of vowels, you have the A. So our question is, how do I know the difference between the A and the O? Since the vowels look the same, the kamats, the kamats chatuf, they look the same. How do I know the difference? Well, syllabifying the word will help us understand how to pronounce the word properly so that we get the proper meaning. So take for example, the word that we see here on the screen. Is it chaneni? Is it choneni? Or take another word. Is this tanas, tanos, tonos? Which one is this? Well, once I syllabify, then I understand exactly how to pronounce the word and I get the right meaning of the word. Now, let me give you a rule to keep in mind. When you are syllabifying and you're specifically looking at the kamats or the kamats chatuf, you're remembering this rule, that when there is a closed syllable, 
that ends in a consonant. And there's an unaccented syllable. The accent is somewhere else in the word, but not on that syllable. Then you're going to have a short vowel. It's going to be a kamatz chatuf. And some people remember this as the rule cuss, C-U-S-S, because it's a closed, it's an unaccented syllable that requires a short vowel, cuss. But let's take a look at these two words. Chaneni or choneni and then tanas, tanos, etc. Which one is it going to be? Let's first take a look at tanas or tonos or tanos, etc. Let's syllabify it and let's see what we get. Well, we have the accent on the letter ta. So we know that that's where the accent goes. And then the second thing we do is we split the vowels, right? And when we split the vowels, this is what we get. We have one kamatz on one side and then the other kamatz on the other side. It's kamatz chatu for kamatz, we'll determine right now. So we have the syllabified word and we have the accent on the tav. And now we remember the rule, the cuss rule, closed, unaccented, short. And we apply this to each syllable. Is the first syllable ta, is it closed? The answer is no, it ends in the vowel, so it's open. So this rule immediately falls out. But you know what, just to press this further, let's just ask, is it accented? It is accented. So once again, this rule completely falls out because it's supposed to be unaccented for a kamatz hatuf. So we know that this syllable is going to be ta. It's a regular kamatz, the long vowel, ta. Now let's go to the second syllable. And we're asking the same question. Is this a kamatz hatuf or is this a regular long kamatz? Is it nas or is it nos? Well, we ask the question, is this a closed syllable? And the answer is yes, it ends in a samech. So it has to be closed for this reason, because it's a consonant. And then we ask, is it accented or unaccented? We look at the word, we see there is no accent. The accent is on the preceding syllable. So here we have an closed syllable, a syllable that's unaccented. And for this reason, we know that it has to be a short vowel. And so a short vowel is going to be O, oh, a kamatz hatuf. And for this reason, we read this as ta nos. We accentuate the first syllable because that's where the accent is. And we read this as a kamatz hatuf because it's closed and it's not accented, ta nos. But let's take a look at the other word, chaneni or choneni. How do we work with this? Well, we want to syllabify it to make sure that everything falls into its parts and then we're going to read it. We can see that there's an accent and that's going to help us identify the accented or the unaccented syllables. But now let's try to syllabify it. I see that there is a dagesh in the noon. I know that it's a strong dagesh because there's a vowel right before it. So I'm going to split it. And then I'm going to write it out. I have the two noons. It was noon with a strong dagesh and I split it up, I write it out, and I have the two noons, and I write down the noon with the shva, the silent shva, because I, brought, I pulled it out from the degesh. And so now I have this word here, chet, noon, 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 and yod. And now I'm ready to syllabify. But let me just remind us that the shva that I pulled out and that I wrote down, it has to be a silent shva because it came from within the dagesh. And so now as I syllabify, I ask myself the question, which shva is it silent or vocal? Because that will tell me whether to go before the shva or after the shva. Well, I know it's a silent shva because that's what I brought out from the dagesh. And so I'm going to go 
after. And then beyond that, I will simply split the vowels. And this is what I get. I have the het and the noon and the silent shva. I go afterwards, I divide afterwards. And then I split the tere and the hirak yod. Now remember that the accent is falling on the noon with the tere. And now I'm ready to try to read this word. I look at the first part and ask myself, is this a kamatz or a kamatz chatuf? I know that it's a kamatz chatuf because I have a closed syllable which ends in a consonant, therefore it's closed, and it's not accented because there's no accent on it. And because it's closed and not accented, I know it's short, and so I know that it's chonneni, chonneni as opposed to channeni, which would be long. So here we have chonneni. Now let me give you one other way of identifying a kamatz chatuf. And this is probably a simpler way. If you have a word that is familiar to you, and when you look at the dictionary or the lexicon, that word is spelled with a holam like you have here, or a shuruk like you have here, and then all of a sudden things change and the vowels change and you see a kamatz all of a sudden, you're gonna know that that kamatz is a o because it had o or u in its lexical form. Let me give us an example. Take the word oznaim. I see a kamatz or a kamatz chetuf, I don't know which one it is and I don't wanna divide it right now. But I know that the word in the dictionary is ozen. Ozen means ear. Oznaim means two ears. I look in the dictionary, I see that it's ozen. And I see that there's a holum. There's an o sound. That's it. I know the answer. It's going to be oznaim because of the lexical form with an o. Or let's say I have the word Vayakom or Yakam, which one is this? Is this an O or another one that I've highlighted? Well, I know that in its simpler form, it's going to be Yakum with a Shuruk. Well, because it's a Shuruk, I know that whenever there's a change in the vowel and it changes to what looks like a Kamatz, it's going to be an O sound. So this will read as Vayakom as an O. Or Take another example, right here. Kol nefesh, kal nefesh, which one is it? I know that when I look at the lexicon, it's kol with a holum. And so I know for this reason, it's always going to be kol, even if there appears to be what looks like a kamatz. It's actually a kamatz chatuf. So syllabifying and giving attention to the original forms in the dictionary or the lexicon will actually help us to read the words properly. It will help us to read the Bible properly. And this will affect the meanings of words. And of course, we want to make sure that we read and we understand the Bible properly. So let's go back to the chapter, Genesis chapter one that we've been reading at, uh, reading from and that we're familiar with. And let me bring up a verse here this verse appears at the end of God's creation. When we look at the creation passage and we see God coming to the end of creation and we see that he's looking at everything that he has created and he says that it was all good, he sees that it was all good. We see this verse appearing at the end of the creation passage and we read it and it says, Vayar Elohim, and God saw et kol asher asa. And my question is, do I read this as kol or do I read this as kal? He saw everything that he had made. Well, when I look at the lexicon, I see that this word appears as kol with a holum. And so I know that even if it has a, what looks like a kamatz, it's going to be a kamatz chatuf it's going to have the pronunciation O, kol. But I can even look at the word itself and syllabify it and understand that 
this falls and follows the rules of syllabification which gives me the short vowel. I see that this ends in a lamed which is a consonant so it's a closed syllable and I look at the word and I see that there's no accent here. The accent is somewhere else. Actually, the accent is right here at the end of asher. It's the accent munach that we learned. So I see that this is closed. I see that it's unaccented. And for this reason, I know that this is going to be the sound o. And I read it as kol. And this helps me to distinguish this word from other words that have a similar sound but they have a different meaning and I want to make sure that I read this word properly and I understand this word properly. And so God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good. Well we can say at this point sof hadavar, the end of the matter. Once again we've come to the conclusion of this lesson but we are gaining more and more knowledge to be able to read the Hebrew Bible and that's exactly what we're going after. That's what we want to do and so as we continue moving forward we'll pick up piece by piece and we'll learn more and more to make sure that we read and we understand the Bible in its original language.